kick it ease, capital in the 21st century has been making waves recently. Now, he argues we need to levy an annual tax on capital wealth, but is that the right way to go? Now, Dr. James Galbraith doesn't think so. Galbraith is a professor of government at the University of Texas at Austin and an expert in labor, employment, and macroeconomics. Throughout his career, Galbraith has been an important voice emphasizing the problems of inequality in, in today's economy. Now, his most recent book, Inequality and Instability, a study of the world economy just before the great crisis, he looks at how the financial sector has increased income inequality and created instability. I started off by asking him why income inequality matters in the first place. Now, here's what he had to say. Well, because it's been going up so rapidly and because uh, the... Well, because wealth is power, and that is something which has become increasingly clear if you look at the politics of the United States in recent years. Now, Dr. Galbraith, a lot of people are talking about the book Capital in the 21st Century, written by French economist Thomas Piketty. Now, that's on the subject of income inequality, and he recommends we deal with income inequality via a tax on high wages, basically a soak the rich strategy. Now, do you think this is the right approach? Well, Piketty's uh, um, proposal is for an annual tax on capital wealth. Uh, and I find that, personally, I find that quite problematic. I, I don't know quite how you go about appraising capital wealth on, a, on an annual basis, how you go about capturing wealth that is uh, mobile across countries. Uh, and it strikes me that the effect of the proposal is basically to depress capital asset prices, which I'm not sure why that is a reasonable economic objective. I favor instead progressive income taxes, uh, reduction of loopholes and exemptions, and a stiff inheritance tax, which is something that one can impose once, uh, appraisal upon death, basically, uh, and that gives an enormous incentive for charitable distributions before death, which is, I think, really the effective way of getting large fortunes divided up and back into circulation in a socially useful uh, fashion. It's the way that we do this in the United States, and uh, everybody who goes to a university or to a hospital is a beneficiary of that system. Now, you said that you like a, a tax on um, income uh, opposed to an annual tax on basically capital wealth. Can you differentiate between income and capital wealth? How, how would you do that? Well, very simply, in, the income tax is something we've had in this country since 1917. Everybody knows how it works. There are elaborate rules. You report your income and you, you pay a tax according to a table. Capital wealth is um, it's, it's your stocks, your bonds, the value of your property. I don't know what other household assets you would put into that, maybe the value of your artwork. Appraising that on an annual basis uh, would be exceptionally complicated, and it overlooks the fact that the, the very wealthiest people know where the Cayman Islands are. So mm -hmm. it's not as though you would have uh, a complete uh, access to their records in any event. Well put. I like that. Very simply, they, they know where they are. Now, here's the issue for me, though. So corporate margins in the U.S. are high, and supposedly, supposedly, margins are mean reverting, basically meaning that they can't stay high, but they are staying high, and people want to know why they're staying high. They want to know if, this, if these profits are coming at the expense of labor, and if so, what we can do or what we should do about it. What's your view? Most important single thing that we could do right now is to raise the minimum wage, and we should raise it beyond the $10.10 uh, that's in the president's proposal. Uh, there's proposals in California to put it up to $13, which strikes me as, as, as uh, pretty good. The effect of that would be to raise living standards for maybe 30 percent of American workers, uh, and that would be a very important equalizing, uh, stabilizing uh, uh, action that is something that uh, would in fact not doesn't require federal expenditure and could be taken over phased in over the course of the next year or so that's that's where I would put my priority what do you say that to those that would argue that it will put small business owners out of out of business the main uh, counter argument which is that this has been tried in the United Kingdom and elsewhere and the high minimum wages doesn't put small businesses out of work and the reason is that their customers have more money so yes they may have to pay a little more to their workers but they have more money coming in the door and so the two things basically balance out there you go now we want to look at how much labor and how much capital a business needs what's more important to a successful business well, both are important. I think what we're seeing now is that 
capital equipment, particularly electronic equipment, has become very cheap for business. So we're having a lot of substitution of capital for labor, uh, and that is one of the reasons why employment growth has been so slow in the in the in the uh, uh, period since the great crisis six years ago. Uh, so what we need to have is ways in which to find work for people uh, that is useful, uh, that is uh, rewarding, and that, that does things that need to be done. And that, uh, I think, does require us to ask how we can expand the not-for-profit sector in particular, uh, so as to get more people uh, you know, out of their houses and doing things that are uh, rewarding to them and, and needed by the larger community. Now, Dr. Galbraith, I know this is kind of high level and out there, but is mm -hmm. capital distinct from wealth? Uh, in economics, yes, the two terms are quite distinct. Capital is typically used to refer to uh, economically active uh, forms of, of uh, machinery and, and the financial uh, forces behind machinery, whereas wealth typically includes many things which are basically idle, land, uh, jewelry, art, and so forth is all part of your, your house value is part of your wealth. Uh, what Piketty has done is to group all of these things together uh, into one single thing which he renames capital. I think that's um, causes some, some problems of understanding, causes some confusion, and then proposes to tax it all. Uh, a sensible taxing proposal on the upper end, I mean, again, I've spoken about the inheritance tax, but if you want to do something which is on a continuing basis, taxing uh, what economists call rent, which is to say land value, uh, is a very uh, sensible way of that does not impinge upon economically active uh, forms of uh, wealth. So that's a, uh, uh, that's a distinction which should properly be drawn and which I, I don't think was drawn correctly in Piketty's book. Now, going back to uh, Piketty's book, I, I haven't read this book yet, but my understanding is, is that he talks a lot about capital as a physical asset, but he measures it as a financial asset, basically making capital money-based money, money -based wealth that is heavily dependent on how that wealth is valued in the open market. So doesn't this make measuring capital the way Piketty does heavily dependent on market values? It is entirely dependent on market values for privately held wealth. And for publicly held wealth, uh, what he does is he he tots up the cost of of uh, acquisition of that capital and then offsets it by the public debt. So for something like the uh, fast train networks, the TGVs in France, you would have a uh, a cost of, of production and the public debt, and the net of it is near to zero, which is a strange way of, of, of taking a very important capital asset and saying, well, it's really not worth anything. It clearly is. That was Dr. James Galbraith, professor of government at the University of Texas, Austin.